afternoon, everyone. All right. Hello. Welcome to our live lecture. My name is Billy Barnett. We have my friend Anne with us, Ms. Ovison. Would you like to say hello? Hi, everyone. Hello to those who were here last week as well. Welcome back. Hope everyone's having a good Tuesday. Let's see. I'll start sharing, hopefully. Let's do this. There we go, this will look better. All right. Now we're gonna start on the right foot. <laughs> Happy New Year to me. <laughs> uh, so my name is Billy Barnett. Welcome to week two, Psychology of Play. You are in the right place. I, I guarantee you, it's hard to get into the wrong place unless you are trying to crash our party. Um, and so Anne is here to make sure that the chat box stays happy and psychology of play -y for all of you guys so that you can have a good time um, talking to each other in the chat box. Uh, we're gonna go over uh, week two stuff. Um, we're gonna talk about the brain and flow. And we're gonna talk about positive psychology. I'm gonna go through uh, wellness and the PERMA model. And then we're gonna talk about the assignments for the week. Um, and we will squeeze in a break so that this is not <clears throat> too much all at once. Um, okay, how are we doing so far? Everybody with me? Good. Right. Um, yes, Katie is one of the instructors in our virtual lecture group. Um, okay. So, you know, I think I want to do this by telling you a little bit about me first. Um, so I am, I am Billy. Here's my family. My wife is Lauren. My kids are Elizabeth and William. Um, Elizabeth and William are in the other room because they're doing homeschooling. Um, so you might hear Minecraft in the background <laughs> if my microphone is too loud because um, William is done with his schooling and he's now in fun time. Um, so I'm a licensed counselor. Um, I have been teaching this class in one form or another for nine and a half years. I did photography for a whole long time. I was a professional photographer for about uh, 15 years. And I played the drums before that. I played the drums for about 10 years. And that was how I learned about full sales. Some of my friends came through here way back in the 90s. Because um, full sale is known for its recording <clears throat> school. And so, how about you guys? What brings you guys here? a little bit about my background. What do you guys do for fun? What do you guys enjoy? What do you hope to get better at from psychology of play? Ding, ding. <clears throat> cool. Video games, more film, more games, music production, and there you go. Graphic design, cool. Digital cinematography, nice. Cybersecurity, there we go, nice. That's what I think my brother should do, but I can't get it. Music business, <laughs> to manipulate people having fun, yes. Creative writing. Yeah, there's all over the place. That's great, there's a lot of our programs being represented here. That's the cool part about this class is everybody comes from um, all of the programs in, in this class. And so that's cool. Um, so 
we're going to start off uh, this lecture with the material on the brain. Um, I do this to get it uh, tidied up and out of the way. <laughs> it's the positive psychology is the stuff that I really like um, this week. And so once we get through some of the stuff on the brain, then uh, we're going to get <clears throat> into the stuff that I like more. Um, but more pictures of my family, which brings me to my favorite optimism. Everybody needs a little bit of optimism. Hello, 2021. 20, I call this 2020 2.0 um, because I think that works way better. <laughs> 2020. Um, so it's kind of weird that we fit optimism and pessimism into this material on the brain because it's kind of like an outlier. So let's knock that out of the way first. What is optimism? What does optimism mean? What is this optimism stuff? 2021 is going to be amazing. <laughs> Thank you, Anne. I needed that. <laughs> Positive thinking. Yeah. Yep. It's the tendency to expect the best possible outcome, seeing the most hopeful aspects of the situation. These are the like glass half full kind of kind of things, right? And so optimism. Um, is a very powerful force. And this is the way that I like to, you know, look at things first. Um, it's kind of like that whole uh, innocent proven, until proven guilty thing. Like everything is awesome until there's enough evidence for me to go, wait a minute, maybe we should go a little bit deeper here. Because when we do, then we need to start looking at the other side, which is pessimism, right? <clears throat> and so these are like, uh, polarized concepts, because this is a tendency to expect the worst possible outcome or to look for the negative aspects of a situation, right? So the big question here is, should you be one or the other? Should you balance out a little bit of both? And what kind of situations do you think determine how to navigate between these two opposing lenses of life. <clears throat> Balance is the way, right? So, then he says, hope for the best and expect the worst. Yeah. I think, um, I don't know, I may sound like a parent here, but I think the more you have an opportunity to um, live, and have things happen in life, the more you get better at your way of filtering these things. And so as a counselor, I've had to um, expect the worst and hope for the best. And I'll tell you, I've become a little bit cynical <laughs> um, in some of that. But what we want you to do here is to know that we don't want to uh, presume that optimism is always what you should do. What do you think could happen if you always have an optimistic lens? What I have you guys write in the chat box here. What do you think you, what do you think could happen if you're always optimistic? Patrick, unrealistic expectations. You get really burnt out and start becoming disappointed. Getting your hopes up, self yourself, set yourself up for failure. <clears throat> you could be blinded by the positivity and not see the reality of a situation. Yes, you get blindsided, yep. Expectations equal disappointment, yeah. Yeah, you could become an idealist and life may not measure up to your ideals. And so, Take the same idea about pessimism. What happens if you're always pessimistic? You never do anything. Yep, you give up easily. 
to come and going. Yeah. No friends, depression. You never achieve if you get better. Yeah, Debbie Downer. Yep. Yep. The negative out outlook will affect the rest of your life for sure. <clears throat> and so, somewhere in these two opposing lenses of life, there's that middle area, you know. Um, even though it's in the middle, I don't think it's gray. <laughs> I think it is very much uh, where our own perception lives. And one of the things I heard this week is that art is based on perception. And I think that's cool. Um, how you perceive how stuff is uh, can be used in a great way. And so, yeah, Robert, yeah, rational mind versus an emotional mind. That's part of it for sure. So, there we go. In a bit of irony, <laughs> the tendency that you identify with is going to be the one that you see when you look back at life. And so, when you, when you have <clears throat> a hope of things going well, when you look backwards at life, you're going to see through that lens of wanting things to be optimistic. When you expect things to be bad and you look backwards, sometimes the tendency, not always, but generally the tendency is you look back and you're, you see the negative. And it may be, oh, look, I avoided this, I avoided that, and stuff like that. But when you look backwards, you're going to look through that pessimistic lens. And so you might look backwards and see all of the times you avoided uh, getting hurt. Um, so, you know, there's value in both. But that's what life existence is about. The existential dilemma is very much about what do you do with all this stuff, you know? So there we go. So I'm looking back at my participant box here. One of the things I want to do is uh, just invite you guys to, uh, to know. Um, I want you to feel like you are able to unmute yourself anytime you like and let me know what your thoughts are. And um, when you do that, I will um, let you speak because you have the ability to unmute yourself, I believe, the way that it's set up. Um, and I want this to be an opportunity for you guys to um, have this be your session instead of me lecturing at you too much, um, which is why I want to have that break at some point here so that as you guys, uh, give you guys a time to talk to each other without having something going on that you're supposed to be doing. So if at any time you feel like you got something you want to say, let me know. But I do ask you to be mindful of the fact that um, there's a bunch of us here and um, we want everybody to have an opportunity to share. So if it gets to be like one person always saying everything, I might put that up. Um, but it's your time. Is talking required? No, only by me. <laughs> All right. So the slide here, what forms of play are great for, are, are good for our brains? The, uh, the answer is generally everything, right? All play is good for your brain. But I have a special thing. I play chess in therapy with kids. Um, I find that it's an opportunity for them to make me look bad. <laughs> and um, chess is very cool. Chess is like life. It teaches you how to do strategy and how to do cause and effects and how to be able to plan ahead. And so many things that happen in chess are things that you can plan ahead for. And it teaches you valuable skills about how to organize and plan. And so I like it. Um, and here's a very old video of 
my buddy Terrence, who teaches this course, who tried out for Big Brother a while back, many years ago. Because we're all older now. <laughs> and they look like <laughs> in these videos. <laughs> and he tried out for Big Brother. And chess, chess is his thing. Terrence is to chess as I am to photography. And um, this was his tryout video. And it was a short game. <laughs> so he has a, uh, a chess club that he actually hosts um, in Orlando. It's usually at full sale, I believe, or we generally get campus time for it. So anyway, that's one of our other instructors beating up at chess, because chess is fun. All right. Um, we're going to do another video here. The way that I have found that this works is, I don't know if you guys did a video last week, but um, when I play a video on Zoom and then I try to put it on YouTube, it says you can't do that. And so for the sake of that, what I'm going to do is share this link in the chat box. And so if you guys click on the link when I put it in the chat box, you can watch it on your side. Uh, and when you're done watching it, let me know. Um, and then I will start speaking again, all right? Copy this and paste it here, and then I will be quiet.
All right, I think most of you guys are finishing up with the video. Thank you very much. <clears throat> so the, uh, the big idea here is that our brains change over time. <laughs> um, so there's a lot going on in that video. Um, part of what I get from it is uh, how I basically do my day now. Uh, while I am working on stuff for the class, whether it's grading or emails or preparing things, I try to make sure that I get up away from my desk and go do stuff because the more I do that, the more uh, I am in a good space to help you guys with your stuff. Um, you know, we teach this class every month and we see similar things every month. And so part of how I stay engaged and um, challenging my brain is to go do things other than sit and stare at my computer screen. <laughs> and so part of this is what's related to mindfulness. And we're gonna kind of get into that in a little bit. But part of that is that our, our brains are wired to exercise and learn at the same time. <clears throat> and so it's cool to be able to be encouraged in this, in this way, because so much of how I was, I guess, managed as an employee when I was younger um, in other jobs was like, always be doing one thing. And if you're not doing that, then you're like not being a good employee or a good steward of what you're supposed to be doing. And what I have found is that the more I am um, engaging my brain by moving my body, the more I am refreshed when I need to really dig down into whatever's going on with the task. Um, and so that's that bit. And so this kind of leads us into um, the idea of neuroplasticity, which is how the brain is wired. And so what you do and learn in life can physically change your brain. And so, uh, sorry, just got a text. <laughs> so the way that our brains learn is very much uh, based on wiring and the neurons that are in our brain. And so how you, how you reinforce what you do is, is not just um, a pattern that you do in your behavior, there's a corresponding pattern in your brain network. And so all of this stuff is related to neuroplasticity. And so this is the changing of the structure, function, and organization of the neurons in response to new experiences. As we learn, our brains make connections between neurons. And the more we do stuff, the more those pathways are reinforced. As we gain new experiences and new information, our brains reroute their own circuitry for improved functioning. And so this, this, these neural connections are the fabric of our brains. And so this is kind of an image of what it looks like. This is the neural network of our brains and they're, they're basically cells that have connections. And um, I like to use an example from my wife's job. She's a, she's a speech therapist and she helps kids make sounds by training the muscles um, to strengthen. And the more the muscles strengthen, the more the sounds are produced. But what has to happen is there, there has to be a way for those connections to form. And so the brain has these cells that look for the closest next door neighbors in their you know, proximity. And as you do stuff, that gets reinforced. And so eventually what happens is those nerve endings find their closest next door neighbors to be able to do a task. And then the more it's done, the more that connection is reinforced. 
And so the ones around it drop off and the ones that are reinforced are the ones that remain. And so this is what neuroplasticity is. And so if you see in the picture here with a newborn, um, there's not so much density. And as they get older, it becomes more dense. And then eventually after they're two years old, these things start to drop off and that's synaptic pruning. And so there you go. That's the concept of neuroplasticity. <laughs> yes, and says learning a new language is actually one of the best things you can do for your brain. Um, and this is very much how my wife and I run our, our home and our lives. Um, she's doing Duolingo. She's learning Portuguese right now because she's already moved past Spanish. <laughs> um, and so my kids are doing this also. Um, and so a whole lot of what we do is based on um, teaching cause and effect. And we do this through um, language. Uh, and there's so much involved in how we use language to get all of our needs met. Um, and so neuroplasticity ties in with that. Uh, whenever I was in high school, I was dating a girl who was in a car accident and she, uh, she was injured very badly and she lost a lot of um, her abilities on the left side of her body. And I was, um, I was there in her life to be able to watch her regain a, a whole lot of these functions back. Uh, and a lot of it was through physical therapy, but what physical therapy does is it uses this neuroplasticity um, trait that we all have to relearn old skills that were previously accomplished. But as those parts of the brain get damaged, the brain has the ability to find new areas in a similar, similar area of the brain to go regain those skills back. And that, that, plasticity, that plasticity that's built into our brains is what this is all about. So it's very cool. All right. Um, that's pretty much what I want to get to on the brain today. We don't pay attention to boring things. We pay attention to things that are fun. And the more senses we can integrate into our learning, the better chance we have of holding on to that information. And that's what that video was really tapping into. The more you can, the more senses you can pull into your learning, the more you are going to be able to hold on to that information because you file it away in interesting places in your brain. And then you, you, you find those significant places to store things. And since they're significant, you go back to those areas to recall that information. And that's how learning happens. So why is it important to understand how the brain works? Because you have to know how something works before you can fix it. <laughs> I find this to be true in fixing cars. I can't fix cars because I don't know anything about how to fix them. <laughs> but I work with people all the time because I've learned a whole lot about how people work. And the more I learn about how people work, the more I learn about how I work. And then the better I become at being me. Cool. All right. That is pretty much the stuff that I wanna cover on the brain. All right, let me stop sharing this one. You guys have any questions on that? It's a lot of stuff we just went through. <laughs> All right. Okay. Do something good for your brain. Yes. Go for a walk. Read a book. Talk to somebody in Portuguese. <laughs> okay. So we're going to talk about positive psychology and more family photos. My family is really into Disney. 
we've been doing Disney lately. So, it's good to have a photographer in the family, yes. That's me. Um, <clears throat> we're gonna do super, super brief history from like 50,000 miles up about psychology because what I wanna do is not tell you about the history of psychology. <laughs> I wanna tell you about why positive psychology is what we focus on. Um, so before the great world wars, uh, psychology was um, about positive stuff. It was about developing talent. It was about um, nurturing the things in our lives that were important. It was about building up our strengths, our character strengths. It was about um, looking for ways to do self-improvement. <clears throat> and when the world wars came along, people came home with brain injuries. And so we now call those PTSD. At that time, they did not have names for it yet. And so they called it shell shock at first because people in World War I spent a great deal of time in bunkers. And um, as they were receiving artillery rounds, they would get very understandably freaked out by having artillery rounds come in. And so that was called shell shock. And when they would come home, they would have some residual um, feelings of that. And so whenever you would, they would hear loud noises, they would have flashbacks and they didn't know what that was other than shell shock. So anyway, um, we knew a little bit more about, about it by the time of World War II. Um, and so after that, it became apparent that they could make money with psychology through government grants for research on the medical side. Um, and so what ended up developing was there was a medical model of psychology as its main lens. Think about how we just did optimism and pessimism as two competing opposing lenses. Um, clinical psychology is a lens of how we look at um, people. And the lens of clinical psychology is what kind of dysfunction do you have? And this came about by having the need to help people who were hurt. And so psychology became targeted towards hurt people instead of for everybody. And so as psychology became more for people who were experiencing symptoms, it became more like a stigmatized. Um, and there were some good things that came out of it, but there were some bad things too. And so there were huge strides in the understanding of therapy and mental health. 14 disorders became more manageable and new treatments were identified and developed. But psychology became a field of victimology and practitioners, what about treating mental illnesses within a disease framework of damaged habits, drives, childhoods, brains? And consequently, there's, there's no method to prevent mental illness. Um, and so the way to think about this is when you look at psychology and you look at people in general, Psychology looks for a diagnosis for a person. And so when I have somebody come in to me for counseling, they have to turn in a diagnosis basically in order to get treatment. And the insurance company wants me to give them a significant diagnosis in order to pay for it. And so this is what the disease model is looking for. It's looking for significant symptoms in order to justify reimbursement for, for treatment. And so I have to basically ask a client, you know, what are the symptoms that you're presenting? And I have to go 
figure out which of those, think about these 14 disorders that became more manageable. I'm supposed to go be looking for those things <laughs> and to put this client into one of those categories. And if I do, then they'll pay for it. But if I don't, they may not because it doesn't justify treatment. And so when I say I got a little bit cynical, this is why. <laughs> and so, <clears throat> um, Carlos, there's no way to avoid mental illness, but is there a way to strengthen mental fortitude? Absolutely. And um, so a lot of what we are going to get into in like the second half of this class is what can you do to strengthen uh, your, your, your personal strengths? And you're gonna have an opportunity to kind of um, explore those in the quests that you do each week. So the short answer is those are what our coping skills are, but also those are what mindfulness and wellness are about. And so positive psychology is the flip side of all of this. Positive psychology is for everybody. Okay. Positive psychology looks at people not as victims, but as just normal humans. Um, what I was going to say a minute ago was uh, <clears throat> in order to be licensed, I had to basically go learn everything that was in this manual uh, called the DSM, the Diagnostic and Statistic Manual, Diagnostic and Statistical Manual. And I diagnose mental illness through lining up people's symptoms with what's in that book. And so positive psychology doesn't do that. Um, there's sadly misdiagnosis as well. Yeah, I spent a great deal of my time um, re-diagnosing bad diagnosis <laughs> when I worked in a group home. Because <clears throat> the sad thing is most people only diagnose what they have um, experienced and most therapists don't experience things outside of their specialty. And most, most therapists aren't specialized in everything. And so they have tunnel vision. And so they diagnose what they're familiar with. And people, therapists are human and they, they, they also don't like to branch out into areas that they're uncomfortable in. And so I challenged myself as a therapist to go see as much as I could so that I was not experiencing that tunnel vision. Um, so for positive psychology, we're looking at, at people through a different lens. We're looking for their strengths. What about people, what skills do people have? What are they good at? What do they enjoy? What do they like? And what can we build up? What can we do to build up that mental fortitude that we were talking about just a minute ago? Why is there a need to put a label on behavior? Yes, Eric, that is a very good question. That is what the disease model looks for because they're looking for justifying treatment based off of something that they can identify as being um, significant. <laughs> and so that's what symptoms are used for, is to look for where does, where does this behavior fit? Is it, is it based on mood? Is it based on anxiety? Is it based on psychosis? And there's like a way to triage where all of those things live. And there's groups of diagnosis type stuff, like little, little camps. And so in one camp of mood disorders, there's like six or eight different things that live in that little area. In anxiety, there's another six or eight things that live in, live in that area. And so we triage those into those groups and that's how they know what they're looking at. And it's, it's a lens that um, the system <laughs> insurance looks at. Um, so that's that. Over on the positive psychology side, we don't. We look for what are the strengths. So positive psychology is not the study of pathology, weakness, and damage. It's the study of strength and virtue. Treatment is not just fixing what's broken. It's nurturing what is best. It's not concerned with illness or health. It's much larger than that. It's about work, education, insight, love, growth, and play. It's the difference between being proactive and reactive. You can't find happiness by assigning power to things outside of your control. So if we know that we can't prevent mental illness, 
we can't find happiness by diagnosing <laughs> mental illness. It doesn't, it doesn't fix anything. A diagnosis doesn't fix anything. So when I have somebody come into my office now, since I don't take insurance, <laughs> I get to do whatever I want. <laughs> and so when people come to me and they say, I want help, I go, great. What do you do for fun? <laughs> what are you good at? What do you like? And so what I do is I focus on the things that they are interested in and the things that make them happy. And so my treatment plan is about helping them do more things that they like and encouraging them in, in areas where they feel like they can grow. And so now my job is to help build people up through looking for their strengths and their abilities. And so I am now no longer tied to a diagnosis. Now my thing is to encourage people and everybody has the ability to know what they like and what they enjoy, what they're good at. People don't have to know how to diagnose themselves. That is not okay. <laughs> and well, I don't have to do that either. Now we're both working from the same common thing. We're working on the, on the self. And so now I enjoy therapy way more <laughs> and my clients like me more. <laughs> um, and so what I've done is I've just taken some of these big picture things of not everybody is, is a diagnosis, nor should they be, but everybody is a person and everybody has a story to tell. And so I am a specialist of sorts in anxiety and trauma. And I help people get over their anxiety and trauma by helping them tell their stories. And that's way more fun than trying to do clinical psychology on an anxiety um, treatment plan. It's way more fun to help people tell their story than it is to do anything else clinical because I'm now working with a person instead of a diagnosis. And that's way better. And so here we are gonna go through um, two, two dudes in the field of positive psychology. Um, first we have Dr. Martin Seligman. He's kind of the, um, the father, grandfather, godfather, I don't know, <laughs> the main guy <laughs> for positive psychology. Um, you guys, I think we still have that video for you, a TED talk that he did a couple of years back on positive psychology. He basically gives the like big why behind positive psychology. Um, and so for our purposes here, uh, just know that he wrote a lot of the um, early content on positive psychology as a whole. And we're gonna uh, unpack the PERMA model here towards the end of our lecture. Um, so Seligman, is the main guy for advocating for positive psychology over clinical psychology, okay? And then there's this other guy and his name is Dr. C. <laughs> Mihai, Cheeks and Mihai. Um, I don't do as good of a job saying his name as my friend Katie does, but it's Mihai Cheeks and Mihai. Uh, so this is the guy who is behind Flow. And so uh, Flow is really cool. We're gonna kind of get into some of the elements of Flow. So those are the only two guys that I think we expect you to know about. Um, <laughs> So here's something Dr. Cheeks and Mihai said, the best moments in our lives are not the passive, receptive, relaxing times. The best moments usually occur if a person's body or mind is stretched to its limit in a voluntary effort to accomplish something difficult and worthwhile. It's a state of consciousness when people find genuine satisfaction. So think about this, when have you ever felt a sense of timelessness or a complete absorption in a task, like when you're doing stuff you like. 
feeling a sense of strength or alertness or effortless control. When you see all of these things kind of happening all at the same time, that's what flow is about. It's a positive mental state in which people are so involved in an activity that nothing else seems to matter. The experience is so enjoyable that people will continue to do it even at great cost for the sheer sake of doing it. Yeah, you guys are bringing up a whole lot of activities that you experience flow in. Yeah. Oh my gosh, yeah, Soul. We just watched Soul, my wife and I. And it's like our class in a movie. <laughs> So here are the, there's nine elements in flow. There's clear goals every step of the way. There's immediate feedback to your actions. There's a balance between challenges and skills. Action and awareness are merged. Distractions are excluded from your awareness. There's no worry of failure. Your self-consciousness disappears. Your sense of time becomes distorted and the activity becomes its own reward. So, Natori, I find myself completely zoned out from the world when I listen to music and play video games. Yeah, I'm completely focused. Is this similar to the zone that athletes feel? Yes, so check it out. Um, I do an example here of when, when you're driving a car. Um, I assume most of you drive or have driven and um, you can keep the car in between the ditches, right? And so you got a ditch on one side and a double line on the other. And you're driving down the road and you can turn on your music, right? So you're listening to music. And when, when, when a song comes on that you know, and you're totally into that song, you can totally space out listening to your song. And you can be like in your song for like five minutes. But yet you're still driving a car <laughs> and you're not worried about the ditch on the right. And just on those other two lines are other cars coming at you just as fast as you're going, but it does not matter because you're in your song and you're totally in the zone while you're in that song and that song has taken you somewhere else in your mind. And so now all of the stuff that it takes to make your car go straight <laughs> is no longer something that you're needing to focus on because you've mastered everything that it takes to drive a car. And so you can go through green lights and stop at red lights and you don't even have to be aware of the fact that they are red or green because you have already mastered how to monitor those so it doesn't mess up your ability to be in your song. And then your song can end and you can be stopped at a red light and you can be like, how in the world did I just get here? <laughs> and so that is what flow is about. It is actually a state of hypnosis, believe it or not. Um, it's a self-hypnosis. Whenever you experience diminished consciousness of self, which is one of the qualities of play, it's also in flow. Your sense of time becomes distorted and your self-consciousness disappears. This is a, um, this is a form of self-hypnosis that we do because we can. It, it is so reinforced that it is no longer something that we consciously attain to. Um, and so that's how flow is. Also, when you guys you know, play a video game, you can uh, think about like old Super Mario Brother game, right? For Super, for Super Mario Brothers, you knew like where to jump, <clears throat> like down to the like micro, small area of when you're supposed to jump <clears throat> and you knew like how to make the controller go through the specific pattern in order to get through a level <clears throat> and the more you practice it the better you get at it to where eventually you can do that stuff in your sleep <laughs> even though you're not playing the game and so that practicing of it is what leads to flow so there's three conditions that foster it you've got to have a goal you gotta have balance and you have to have feedback. <clears throat> okay, hold on one second. So when you've got these three conditions, a goal, balance and feedback, 
you have the ability to enter that flow state. <clears throat> when I was playing drums, if I would you know, start something new, I would have to practice it. And so that's my goal is practicing how to get good at this particular new skill playing the drums, right? And the more I practiced it, the better I got at it. And so my goal is to get better at this particular piece. But as soon as I get good enough at it to where there's a balance between my ability to do it and my ability to think it's important to be able to do, that's where the balance is. So when I get good at it, there's now a balance between being good at it and using the skills that I have. And so when you're playing the drums, because you hit the drum, there's immediate feedback. And so the more you get practiced at something you're doing, the easier it is to get into that flow state. Before you are good at it, it's harder to get into that flow state because you haven't yet gotten the balance between your skills and your ability. And so the better you get at it, the closer it is to do it. And so I know you guys have been putting up lots of ideas already for this, for this slide about when you've experienced flow. <clears throat> Just going back and looking at some of the stuff you guys are sharing in your messages. Very cool. All right. <clears throat> so what do you guys think? Is flow, is flow good? Do you guys enjoy flow? Um, I do want you to uh, remember that there is some overlap between week one and the qualities of play and week two for flow um, in that they both are diminished consciousness of self and they're both freedom from time. And so in that manner, um, the class is gonna build on itself as we go. All of the stuff that we do each week relates to previous stuff and so there's some overlap here with flow and the qualities of play. And so uh, some of the stuff that you guys might discover if you research flow more is a lot of people do flow for the like adrenaline junkie types. <laughs> so there's, there's a whole side of flow that is about the adrenaline flow. Um, think like roller coasters and certainly sports type stuff. Those are the, um, flow activities that are very much about um, being engaged in um, the rush that you can get from, from the chemicals in your brain. So, all right, let's switch over real quick to wellness. What is wellness? I call it the art of being okay. <laughs> Um, you're going to find wellness and well-being is a pretty big thing at Full Sail. We get a whole lot of stuff on the staff side from the admin side on Full Sail uh, about wellness. And they try to let us know that wellness is a thing and we should be aware of it <laughs> and we should be involved in it. <laughs> and those of us who teach this class are like, yeah, you're right, we should. We should be involved in in wellness. And so we do some challenges. Um, we do like drink more water challenges, go for more walks challenges, eat healthy challenges. These are all things about wellness. And I think it's funny because um, those of us who teach this course, this is the drum we keep hitting. <laughs> and uh, it's funny to me that they teach this outside of the class uh, to our instructors. And instructors are like, what do you people teach in psychology of play? <laughs> Basically everything that we do at Full Sail, <laughs> just in one class. So wellness and the PERMA model are kind of uh, hand in hand. <clears throat> Notori, wellness is a state of your well-being, such as mental, emotional, and physical, challenging yourself. Yeah, there you go. 
Nice. Good, healthy, healthy habits. Yep. Yeah, there is. Yep, there's daily yoga. Yep. Um, so PERMA is an acronym. And so this comes from Dr. Seligman, the main guy that we were talking about earlier. Um, so we're gonna just go through this really quickly. And this is something that I use with my um, teenager clients to help them. Um, it's kind of the like framework that I do for how they can go do better with feeling good. These are gonna be like obvious things, I think to you, and that's a good thing. Um, I call these Captain Obvious things. Positive emotions. Every day you should have these things. Every day you should have some positive emotion. They're an essential part of our well being. Happy people look back on the past with gladness. They look into the future with hope and they enjoy and cherish the present. So think about earlier, whenever we were talking about optimism and pessimism, we said the lens that you use the most is going to be the way that you look backwards. And so you've got to have something positive in your life every day because. When you look back, if you've got some, some sort of positive lens, you're gonna look back with gratitude and happiness. Um, and so while every day may not be sunshine and roses, <laughs> it's important to be proactive in, in finding something positive every day. Because the more you do that, the more you're gonna look backwards with a positive look. Every day you should be engaged in stuff. When we focus on doing the things we truly care about and enjoy, we can begin to engage completely with the present moment and enter the state of being known as flow. So every day, it's important to do stuff. Um, Captain Obvious, right? Like you should be doing things. Whether that is video games or school or conquering the world, if you just resign to, I'm gonna, you know, sit here and do nothing because I'm being told I'm supposed to shelter in place or whatever, like you're going to go crazy. Um, there, are, there are still ways to engage with your own important stuff, regardless of what um, is going on. And so for me, you know, I find getting out for a walk is a great way for me to break up my feeling like I'm supposed to be sitting in one place. <laughs> Relationships. Everyone needs someone. We enhance our well being and share it with others by building strong relationships with people around us family, friends, coworkers, and neighbors. Relationships are one of the, you know, primary needs in life. So we get into this next week too with our motivation content. Um, but uh, it is very important to have people around you because that's how we stay encouraged and it's how we stay engaged. Meaning, we are at our best when we dedicate time to something greater than ourselves. This might be religious faith, community work, family, politics, a charity, or a professional or creative goal. And so this also comes up next week when we talk about motivation. Meaning is a primary need. So we wanna make, sure that the things we do in our life matter, right? We want our stuff to like matter to other people and we want our stuff to matter to ourselves. And so having something that you're focusing on that is relevant to your life is, is super important. And it's part of being well. <laughs> Danny, I don't play nice with 99.9% .9 of the people. <laughs> yep, there's still 0.01%. <laughs> That's a lot of people. Accomplishment. Everyone needs to win sometimes. To achieve well-being and happiness, we must be able to look back on our lives with a sense of accomplishment. I did it and I did it well. We want to have, you know, this, I, this sense that the stuff that you did mattered and that you were able to do difficult things. Um, when people are down, they feel like their stuff doesn't matter. And I find that helping people look for the things that they 
have done is very validating um, because it's a primary need, but everybody has stuff that they've done. But sometimes we don't assign enough significance to it. And sometimes we just need to be reminded of what that stuff is, that the stuff that, we have a, that, that we've tried to do has brought us this far. And so when you have accomplishment every day that builds, and then you can look back and say, hey, you know what? I made it through some pretty difficult stuff. And so there's hope to go forward. And so these are the, these are the things that make up the PERMA model. Positive emotion, engagement, relationships, meaning, and accomplishment. So when you take all of these things together, these are basically the recipe for, for being well. These are the things that make up a daily wellness recipe. Cool? All right, I think that video doesn't work. Okay, do um, you guys have any questions? We did flow. Positive psychology, wellness, and PERMA. Okay, let's do this. Let's go take a five minute break. Um, I'm going to leave the recording going and I wanna encourage you guys to either take a break or stay here. You can unmute yourselves. You guys can share information. You can share your gaming information and stuff like that. You can talk about um, the quests that you guys wanna work on. We're gonna go through the quests when we come back from our break. I want to give you guys a good amount of time to go through all of our um, assignment stuff for the week so that you have a good understanding of what it is we're going to do. But let's take a five minute break. I'll come back at like 2.10 or 2.11 and we'll keep going. All right. Happy break.
All right. <clears throat> you guys ready to go through the homework? Classwork. <clears throat> Let's do this. Maybe stop sharing. All right. <clears throat> So week two, we have a couple of things. We have the call to play, which is due tonight, right? Yes. And just like last week, this is just a, this is a quiz that you do not need to know any information about. <laughs> you just need to know you. So as long as you know you, you can answer these questions. <clears throat> You don't need to do any of the reading or any of the material that I just covered. You just need to go right in the answers here. You know, one of the things I think I should mention is we do want you to develop your ideas a little bit in this. I get sometimes just like one word or like one sentence answers and um, they want you to aim for three or four sentences. So just uh, be encouraged in that way develop your ideas just a little bit. <clears throat> Don't be like, what makes you happy? You know, rainbows, <laughs> whatever. <laughs> develop your ideas a little bit. Um, you wanna give yourself a little bit more development of your ideas. Um, what are you most grateful for? Like, you could write a few things there. What activities do you engage in to challenge your brain? These are, you know, these are designed to just get you thinking about the direction that we're going to go in this week for your quests. Um, and so that's the call to play. Um, <clears throat> we have an open office hour tomorrow. If you would like to go um, speak with one of the wonderful instructors for psychology of play. <laughs> Uh, we have some time where we are available for you to go ask questions tomorrow. So you can come in to that between one and two. And so 2.3 2 and 2.4 are the reading material where you will find the content that we just went over and some more probably in there too. But the real one that everybody wants to know about is the discussion board. All right, so your initial post is due on Thursday. Um, I like to say every time we do lecture, if you miss the Thursday initial post deadline, that's okay. You can make your initial post um, between Thursday and Sunday also. If you do, you would need to write three responses instead of two, um, and that will cancel out the 10 point late penalty. If you only do two, you can still earn a 90, um, but it's okay to miss the Thursday deadline and we give you the opportunity to make that third response post and still earn full credit on the discussion board. Cool, so you can do that all month. And so another question I get is, could you resend me the infographic because I can't find it now. And so if you click on the orange here in question number one, it takes you to the infographic, yay. So <clears throat> quest one is get connected. Here you will organize an online meetup with family or friends, play a game, watch a movie, or catch up on the latest gossip. And you're going to be turning in an infomercial or presentation using screenshots or video clips from your online meetup discussing the emotional benefits of online social connection. So you're turning in a presentation of some sort. It can be an infomercial, it can be screenshots. You're gonna basically be turning in something from the time when you connected with your friends and you're gonna have that be about the emotional benefits of online or social connection. Think about what we just talked about in the PERMA model, how we talked about relationships being important. That's kind of what we're getting at here. 
why a relationship is important because you can still do online connection and tap into the relationship part of the PERMA model, right? And so that's how I would be doing this. <laughs> um, so it does not have to be an infomercial, but it's gonna be some sort of presentation. We get a lot of um, slideshows for this. We get video clips from this. We get screenshots on a page, that's fine. You're just basically documenting that you had a time where you were getting together with friends and the support for this is the more important part. It's how does this stuff connect to the emotional benefits of online connection, okay? And so you wanna like either talk about that in a video or write it below your images on a page, <clears throat> on a multimedia page, whether it's a slide or an infographic. Um, the wrong way to do this is just to write something down in your discussion board post. Like that is not what we're looking for here. We're looking for a separate file that is visual, um, preferably with audio, but not necessary. Like not, not necessary. Something more than just a little write-up. And that's for all of these quests. We're not looking for a write-up. We're looking for a presentation of some sort. Any questions on this one? Okay. I know you might be thinking of them and you might be writing them. So I'm gonna move on, but um, feel free to write your questions if you have any. Quest two is the weekly plan. And this is just like last week. There is a file that you need. It's right here. It's called the work play fit push plan. And you, you go grab this. I don't know if you guys can see it. Let's see if I can do this. This is the weekly plan template. This is what you need to turn in. You fill in these boxes. You need three items each day for the work section. These are not necessarily going to work. These are just three things that require effort each day. <clears throat> and then you need one goal every day for play, fit, or wellness, and push. And so, um, you can refer back to the week one reading uh, for more information about the weekly plan. Um, and you could also go back and look at the week one discussion board at what your classmates put up last week and see some great examples of a weekly plan in your section. That stuff should be available to you each week if you wanna go back and see what others have done. Um, but basically we want you to fill in all the boxes with at least one item on play, fit, and push, and three items on the, on the work part. And so what you'll do is turn that in as your deliverable file. There we go. So many things to click. <laughs> Does the whole week have to be filled out? Um, so the short answer is yes. <laughs> um, but if you have you know two days where you don't do stuff, I do not grade down on that because um, I figure that's fair. I ask you to do five days with everything filled in. Um, If we choose this quest, ah, if we chose this quest last week, are there any stipulations to choosing this quest for week two? Um, don't turn in the same file twice, <laughs> and um, just try to you know change some things up. The idea here is to identify things that you know you do each week, and a lot of that stuff you might repeat, uh, but um, just make sure that you're you know, identifying some unique things each week so that it doesn't look like the exact same file. Um, there we go, cool. Okay, 
Quest three is learn a new skill. This is the one that I try to uh, steer you all in the right direction on. <laughs> Choose an activity you have never done before that requires repetition for improvement. Things like juggling or doing a cartwheel, drawing a cartoon, playing a musical instrument, dribbling a basketball, stuff like that. Practice this activity over the course of several sessions. The deliverable is document yourself practicing on video and describe how your perception of the activity changed over time. <clears throat> so we get lots of questions on this um, and they typically go with like, I'm an artist. What if I wanna do a new kind of drawing? Um, that is difficult for us to answer because you're supposed to be doing something that you don't do. <laughs> and so um, I know it's difficult to be vulnerable and then turn stuff in. And the irony here is that's exactly what we're asking you to do. <laughs> and so the best way to do it is to pick something from this list, juggling, doing a cartwheel, drawing a cartoon, playing a musical instrument, dribbling a basketball, et cetera. If there are things that you don't normally do, because we want you to document how does your perception change, not how awesome are you at it. <laughs> like we are not trying to prove that you are awesome at something you've never done before. Um, I'm drawing, but haven't tried a drawing tablet. Does that work? Um, so that's a great example of like, because you are already drawing probably, um, a drawing tablet is a new, um, tool, it's not a new skill. Like there's not necessarily a new skill in using a tablet. <clears throat> you could argue that, and that's why we don't really, we don't put up much of a fight on this. <laughs> we just wanna prepare you ahead of time. Don't do stuff you're already good at um, because your perception is not really going to change if you're already good at it. Um, I don't have the means of recording a video. What do I do? Um, so I would say you could probably turn this in as a uh, visual with images and just let your instructor know. If it's me, it's totally fine. If it's not me, let your instructor know and um, they'll work with you. Uh, <clears throat> yeah. So, the idea here is uh, pick something simple that you can do that um, you know you would probably enjoy doing, but don't uh, don't do something very similar to what you're already good at. Um, and we get a lot of people who do that, and it's okay. It's just we want you to have the best. We want you to get the most out of it. And we don't feel like you get the most out of it when you do something you're already familiar with. Um, so there, that's how that goes. Cool. All righty, quest four is press play. Select one of the Psychology of Play podcasts to listen to and reflect on your takeaways. What you're gonna do is you're gonna create an infographic or a presentation highlighting the points that resonated with you must include visuals to accompany text. So let's go over and look. When you come back to the directions, you'll see if choosing plus four, click here for the PYP podcasts. And so here are the here are the podcasts. <clears throat> I highly recommend the Understanding and Dealing with Anxiety. The presenters on that were wonderful. <laughs> it was me <laughs> and one of the other instructors, Monica. Um, so you're going to come listen to any one of the any one of these podcasts, not just mine, and then you're going to basically do an infographic. <laughs> you're going to do an do an infographic on the on on what you got from it. You can do this as a slideshow um, or as you know a creative page that you make, but you're going to just talk about what was in that podcast and what did you get out of it? How did it how did it resonate with you? Cool. 
All right. So, <laughs> yeah, nervous laughter. <laughs> so here's the here's the deal. Um, for the for the initial post, we want to make sure you get all the points. And so the quests were twenty five percent of all of this. And so let's get to the more important part. The more important part is you need a paragraph for questions two, three, and four. And so for question two, which quests did you choose? Describe each experience. Um, typically what happens is we'll get, you know, I chose quests one and two, and then they move on. And that is not a full paragraph. And so we wanna make sure that you write a paragraph there to describe your experience. <clears throat> Okay, and then question number three is the most important because here is where you're going to identify, define, and apply two concepts from the reading. And so think about all of the stuff that we covered in our lecture today. Those are the concepts from the reading that I talked about. None of it was something that I made up. It was all stuff from the reading. So you wanna go back into the reading and pick two concepts like PERMA and flow, neuroplasticity, go talk about those things in a full paragraph for the answer to question number three. <clears throat> it's easiest for us if you underline where those course concepts are in your post, because we know that you have done exactly what you're supposed to do when you underline it. And we know that you're being very intentional about identifying the course concepts when you do that. And then the last essay is explain how completing these quests impacted your well being. And so you want to talk about how did these quests impact your well-being? And so you would be talking about the PERMA model here if you really tried hard. Um, and that's what I would do in the answer to that question. And so <clears throat> a good initial post has three paragraphs with two concepts underlined in it. And your two quests attached below it. And then before Sunday night, you want to come back and do two response posts. And so your, your response posts need to be at least five sentences each. And so we don't want you to lose, like you can lose 10 points if you do not meet that minimum five sentence per response requirement. So if you made your initial post on time, you need two of these. If you posted your initial post after Thursday, you wanna write three of these. And um, this is the RISE model. This is the way that you could or should <laughs> write your response posts. Um, I don't personally grade down for failing to use the RISE model, um, but the RISE model is a great way to uh, strategically write your responses to your classmates with great intention um, because it's asking you to reflect on what your classmates said, inquire by asking them some information, give them a suggestion, and tell them how to make their posts even better by being constructively critiquing, not critical, critiquing. So there you go. Um, we are doing a rubric this, this month, which you should be seeing soon if you have not seen your feedback for week one. Uh, we are using this rubric to enter in your grades and you'll have uh, written feedback from us that references this rubric um, for how your grade was calculated. All right, that was a whole bunch of words. So many words. How are we doing? <clears throat> um, questions. All right, great. We have made it to that point where I have exhausted myself of information and <laughs> I am ready to hear from you. <laughs> <laughs> so, um, 
feel free to go ahead and ask your questions in the chat box. You can unmute yourself and ask your questions too, if you would like. Hi, hi, Mr. Barnett. Hello, go ahead. So my one question is, okay, so week one, we had the weekly plan. Well, on your choice to choose to do the weekly plan, I chose to do the weekly plan. Um, I put stuff that I wanted to accomplish, which was, so I did that weekly plan Wednesday, but I wasn't sure what to put for the Monday and the Tuesday before I started the Wednesday. So it really started this week. So when I make this um, weekly plan again this week, it will be for next week then, because I'll be working on finishing yeah. my own last week. Sure. So that, that is, that's fine. Yeah, that's fine. Yeah. Okay, just scheduling ahead, perfect. Yeah, yeah. Um, the idea here is to identify uh, stuff that is important to you. And when you start the week, you know, a couple of days in, that's expected and that's fine. Planning ahead works just as well. Okay, perfect, thank you. Yeah, sure, that's a good question. <clears throat> All righty. Any more questions? All right, I'm gonna go ahead and stop the recording, but I'm not going anywhere because you're still here. <laughs> so just give me just one second.